Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. We're going to, as you may recall, pick back up from last week. We were about halfway through Hebrews chapter 9, so we'll pick up where we left off. And we did cover these verses, but there's something that I didn't get to mention that I want to talk about. So we'll just go ahead and kind of reset the table here and read chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. Now, when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not, with, not without taking blood, which he offered for himself, and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way to the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food, drink, and various washings, regulations for the body, imposed until a time of reformation. And one of the major points that is emphasized in this particular passage is that everything that he's dealing with, whether it's the tabernacle itself or the regulations of the law, the ritualistic washings, the sacrifices, there are, they are all carnal in nature. And I think that a good way to illustrate this would be to go back to the law itself. So we'll go ahead and read... Leviticus 16, verses 12 through 17. We'll just do the first three verses for right now. And he starts out, and this is part of the law of the priest and the sacrifices. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, so that the cloud of inc incense may cover the atoning... Uh, the atoning cover that is on the Ark of the Testimony, otherwise he will die. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the atoning cover on the east side, also in front of the atoning cover. He shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and to do this with the blood as he did it with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the atoning cover and in front of the atoning cover. And then he continues on in verse 16. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel, because of their unlawful acts regarding all their sins, and he shall do so for the tent meeting which remains with them in the midst of their impurities." When he goes to make an atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent meeting until he comes out, so that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for the assembly of Israel. Now, these instructions specifically are not just for any sacrifice. These instructions are what happens on the day of atonement when the high priest enters into the holy place. He only does so once a year, and these are the rituals that he is to undergo when he enters the holy place. Now, you may notice that on this day, which is the only day that he can do this, he actually enters the holy place on three times. So you have the initial one where he offers the incense. You have the second time where he goes in and offers sacrifices for himself. And then you have the third time where he enters and offers sacrifice for all of the people. And the reason that this is done, and this is part of the reason that this is being brought up in Hebrews, is that there is no need for Jesus to offer incense. Why? Because there's no reason to sanctify God's presence. He's there. So there's no reason to purify the holy place. There's no reason to offer that incense to make sure that it is appropriate to enter, uh, to enter into it and to give offering because that wouldn't make any sense. That's where God literally dwells. And so you cannot be in a more holy location than that. And then the second offering that he enters... Uh, he does so to offer sins for himself and for his family and the other priests of, of Aaron. So if that is the case, 
then Jesus doesn't have to do that one either because he has no son and he's the priest that is entering that place. Therefore, he has no need to sanctify himself since he himself is sinless, which means that not only is this symbolism of the high priest only entering the holy place once a year strong in this particular passage in Hebrews, but it's even more true when you consider that even on the Day of Atonement where he was only able to enter once a year, he still had to do so three times to make sure it was truly ready for making sacrifice for the people. Jesus doesn't have to do any of that. When he enters once, he enters once, and that's it. There is one point of entry for Jesus, and he needs not enter another time. Uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up here is you'll notice that just like in the book of Hebrews, the theme of all of this is a theme of holiness versus impurity. And so why do you offer the incense? Because there is impurity there. Why do you offer the second sacrifice? Because the priests of Aaron have impurities in their lives. And so there has to be atonement made for their sacrifice before they are prepared to offer sacrifice for everybody else. So you have to sanctify the place. You have to sanctify the priests that are giving the offering. And on, then and only then are you allowed to offer sacrifice for everyone else. All of these steps are completely meaningless with Jesus. He doesn't have to do any of them. And so his inherent holiness combined with God's inherent holiness means that there's no reason for any of this to occur under the priesthood of Jesus when he offers his sacrifice in God's presence. And there's an interesting tradition. This is not biblical. This is just something that the Jews did. You'll notice that uh, in the verse that we just read, it says, if he does this incorrectly, he will die. This is a warning given to the high priest that you take this seriously. You do it exactly the way that it is professed. And we know from earlier in the same book, and grew in the Jewish community on the Day of Atonement, which is, you'll notice that the priest, the high priest is the only one that's allowed in the tabernacle. When he's about to give this offering, everybody else has to clear out. They can't just not be in the Holy of Holies. They're not allowed to be in the tabernacle at all. And so what they would do is they would tie a rope around his foot and they would let the high priest go in, but they kept that rope. And the reason that they did is in case God struck him dead, so that they could pull his body out without having to enter the tabernacle and die themselves. Which, again, not actually a biblical commandment, but it's smart if you think about it, because they were, that's how seriously they took this. And when you look at this theme that's going on in this passage, this constant back and forth between holiness and impurity, it makes sense because there's an indication here which I don't think that we often talk about. We don't really discuss God's holiness as often as we probably should. Holiness is good, but it's also incredibly dangerous. God's holiness is something to be afraid of. Uh, there's a great line that I think perfectly illustrates this from the Chronicles of Narnia, and I, I may have shared this earlier, I don't remember. But in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the first time that Aslan's name is mentioned, he's the God character in this particular book series. Uh, Mr. Beaver is explaining to the children who Aslan is and, and his attributes or whatever, and he's the character of a lion. That's, that's what he is. He's a giant lion. And one of the children asks, well, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver looks at him with this confused look. He goes, no, he's not safe. He's a lion. And I mean, that makes sense when you think about it. But yet, yes, he's good, but he's still a lion. And in this context, that's the same kind of idea that is being presented here. Is God good? Absolutely. He would not have allowed these things to happen. He would not have allowed Jesus to come down and give his own life for our sins if that were not the case. But let us never forget that his holiness is dangerous for those that have sin. That's the reason we needed forgiveness in the first place is because our sin puts us at enmity with God. And unless we have those purified from ourselves, we have no way of entering his presence without being killed, just like the high priest did it. And that's why he had to purify himself before he could go in and offer sacrifice for the people. And so now we have a high priest that doesn't have to worry about that at all. He enters into the true tabernacle and he can take us with them. And one other point that I want to bring here too, that holiness creates a distance between God and his people. It has to. It's nobody's, it's, it's not God's plan for that to happen, but by very nature of our sin, we have to stay at a safe distance away from him because otherwise his holiness would destroy us. 
That's the reason that everyone else has to clear out of the tabernacle when the high priest offers this. And there's no way that anybody could see inside the Holy of Holies. You could not see inside of God's presence because the high priest is the only one that is in the tabernacle. Everybody else is out of the building. And so there's no chance that you were able to, if, unless you were the high priest yourself, to see into God's presence and to go into the Ark of the Covenant and to see that. With Jesus, all of that is nullified. Now we are purified, therefore we can enter God's presence as well, not because of our own righteousness, but because of his. And so that's the point that the Hebrew author is making here. So let's go ahead and get into verses 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things having come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands, that is, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify them for the cleansing of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So, no longer do we have to rely upon some kind of man-made reproduction of what Moses saw here. Because even in the Mosaic text, we see that the tabernacle is just based on a vision that Moses was shown of what the tabernacle is supposed to look like. And that's why it uses this word of pattern earlier in the text. And we see now, we have now a more perfect tabernacle. And that's because we don't have to rely on what we were talking about last week, just that image of the tabernacle that God gave Moses that he modeled his tabernacle over, so it was just a copy. This is the true tabernacle. And in that sense, Jesus also is superior because what it's talking about here, where it talks about bulls and goats and uh, the ashes of the heifer that's being sprinkled, when it's talking about the cleansing power of one versus the other, First of all, an animal is innocent, which is the reason that it suffices as a, a temporary sacrifice. But it's not innocent because it chose to do good. It is innocent because it's an animal and it doesn't know any better. It's innocent because it's incapable of evil, not because it had the ability to do evil and chose not to. Jesus is different. He had the ability to do evil and chose to avoid it. And that's why his cleansing power, the cleansing power of the sacrifice that he offered, is superior to that of an involuntary animal. Furthermore, one of the differences in his sacrifice that's going to be addressed here in a little bit is that the bulls and goats, they're an involuntary sacrifice. If you gave them the option, they would not stick around once they see the knife come out. When they, if they knew what was happening, they would not go willingly. Jesus did. He knew what was happening. He knew the price that he was going to pay, and yet he chose to pay it anyway. And so from every angle of the cleansing power of the sacrifice, Jesus is the superior sacrifice. And that's the point the Hebrew author is making here. And really, the other side of this is God's empathy. You see, God knows our depravity. The animal doesn't. The animal doesn't understand what's going on because it's an animal. God not only offered himself a sacrifice, but as we'll find, for example, in Romans 5, he knew exactly who we were. He knew the intent of our heart. He knew the level of our own sinfulness and yet chose to give himself anyway. That's why his sacrifice is superior. And when it talks about your conscience being cleansed, there's almost an aspect of guilt that comes with an animal sacrifice. And to be fair, with any sin, that would be the case, wouldn't it? I mean, we should feel a sense of guilt even after the covenant has come and even after Jesus has come to redeem us of our sins. But there's no way to get to having a clear conscience with the blood of bulls and goats because we essentially took their life, you know, without their consent. With Jesus, it is a gift that is being offered willingly. And that has the power to cleanse the conscience. So let's go ahead and read the next few verses. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, 
so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the violations that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a covenant, there must of necessity be death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when people are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. So here's an interesting analogy that we've switched a little bit from the imagery of the sacrifices and the, t the tabernacle to a legal argument that is being made here. He's saying essentially that when we're talking about a death, because it talks about the mediator of the covenant, that could be equally translated into a will. So it's talking about like your will, your will only goes into effect once you die. You know, your will means nothing while you're alive. It may say, you know, my son gets my stuff when this happens, but that's contingent upon you dying. And so that's something that is not in effect until a death takes place. And so this is what the Hebrew author is saying. For all of these things to take place, for Jesus to be able to offer himself a sacrifice, for the new covenant to come into effect, there had to be blood to seal that covenant. And that blood is the blood that Jesus shed when he died. And that's why his will is now enacted just like a will of somebody that has passed away. And ultimately, we understand this because just like it was in the Old Testament, the price for death, or the price for sin is always death. A death must occur to make recompense for sin. Now, under normal circumstances, it would be our death, but Jesus has taken our place, and that's the point that he's making. When he uses this language of inheritance and will, there is an implied idea that we are the beneficiaries of Jesus' goodwill, just like a, a child when they inherit something from their parent. That's not something they worked for. It's not something they earned. It is a free gift given to them from their parent just by merit of them being somebody that the parent loves and cares for. So in that sense, it is something that is given that is not earned in the same way that Jesus' salvation that he offers is given and not earned. So let's look at Hebrews 9, 18 through 22. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both to the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with blood. And almost all things were cleansed with blood according to the law. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So two points are being made here, especially at the end in verse 22. Without blood, or without blood there is no purification. Remember what we were talking about with impurity versus holiness? There is no way to cleanse anything to make it ready to be used in God's service until blood is applied. In the same way that you're not allowed to use the furniture, you're not allowed to use the tablets and have them enter the Ark of the Covenant, you're not allowed to use any of these things in terms of worship of God until it is purified by the sacrificial blood, we're the same way. We're the instruments. Until the purifying blood is placed upon us, we are unworthy to enter God's presence and we cannot be used in God's service until that takes place exactly the way that it was under the Old Testament. And by the way, this reference, the biblical reference here in verse 20 is directly taken from Exodus 24, 7 through 8. And at this occasion, this is where Moses reads the law and everybody agrees to the covenant and once they have agreed to it, they're saying, this is the covenant that we will live by. He takes that sacrificial blood, he purifies the instruments he's using, and he also places the blood directly on the law. And so the law had to be sealed with blood. And so in the same way that the old covenant had to have blood to institute it, you had to inaugurate the new covenant with the sacrificial blood of Jesus as well. And so this is important because all of these things would have been things very familiar to a Jewish audience that... Once they said, you're questioning whether or not this new covenant, this new Jesus uh, religion is equal to or as good as Judaism. He's saying, just like everything had to happen to take place to put 
Israel under the old law, all of those things took place when Jesus put us under a new covenant. And not only did he do so in the same way, but actually in a better way. And so that's really where his, all of his arguments are springing from. Also, the sprinkling of the book in the tabernacle, those are not actually recorded in the Pentateuch, but it's something that was passed down through Jewish tradition probably from the days of Moses uh, when that was inaugurated, and this is something that is attested to by Josephus. So what he's referencing there isn't actually a part of it, actually isn't recorded in the Pentateuch, but Jewish scholars at that time would have believed this since Josephus is a Jewish scholar from this time, and so this is a tradition that had been passed down that they would have been familiar with. And then when it comes to a sacrifice for blood, if you look at all of the sin sacrifices, because in the old law, there's sacrifices for practically everything. I mean, there's sacrifices for when a baby is born, there's sacrifices for Thanksgiving, but there's no such thing as a sin sacrifice that does not require blood. And so every time a sin took place, blood was required on some level. Now, in Leviticus 5, 1 through 13, there is some accommodation made for poverty. So in other words, if you're just too poor to afford even a small animal like a dove for sacrifice, you can give sort of a meal offering only in the most extreme of circumstances. But even then, the priests were supposed to offer an animal sacrifice at one point in the year to make up for that. And so even in the one exception, there's still blood that is going to be paid later. And so the point in all of this is there is no such thing as forgiveness without blood under the old covenant, and the same is true under the new covenant as well. So let's look at verses 23 through 26. Therefore, it was necessary... Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I heard something. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once the consummation of ages, he has been revealed to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So, what we see in verse 23 there, where it talks about the copies of the things needing to be cleansed and that not needing to take place in heaven, it's kind of a common sense argument, but the thing that cleans you needs to be cleansed, right? Like, if you're trying to clean yourself with something that's not clean, that's not going to work out too well. Uh, actually, I remember there was a, a show that I watched uh, several years ago, and one of the characters, he didn't know that you were, the, the joke is that he didn't know you were supposed to actually wash your towel. And his rationale was, I don't, you know, the towel cleans me, I don't clean the towel. Um, and that's gross, but like it, it sort of illustrates this idea that if you want something to have a cleansing quality to it, it itself has to be clean. And so that's what is being described here, that for the things, the copies to be cleaned, there was this blood needed to, to sanctify it. And in verse 24, the, uh, the, the phrase that is used there, the Greek, means literally before the face of God. And that would have been extremely significant to a Jewish person. And the reason for that is if you go back to the same story that is being referenced in the same, the same era where the covenant was instituted, if you go back at Exodus 33, verses 20 through 23, you'll notice that there God says to Moses, you cannot see my face because no human can see my face and live. So even Moses, the great lawgiver, the one who is revered so highly by the Jewish community and should be, why is he so revered? Because he actually stood in God's presence. So much to the point that God wrote the law with his own finger before Moses' presence. And when Moses came down, his face shone because he had been in God's presence. And yet he never saw God's face. That's not something that he was able to do. And the Hebrew author is saying, 
Not only has Jesus seen God's face, but he is constantly in the presence of God's face. He is looking at him, as the Greek would describe it here, face to face before God. And so this is actually a stark contrast between Moses saying, you revere Moses, that's good. Jesus has actually seen God's face and lived. He has been in God's presence and he offers those sacrifices from where Moses never could. And then in verse 25 where it talks about Jesus essentially being his own sacrifice. He needs no sacrifice because he is his own sacrifice and a fully sufficient sacrifice, unlike the temporary ones that were offered under the law of Moses. So that brings me to my question. Why would Jesus have needed to suffer from the foundation of the world if this were true? What it's talking about there in in verse 26. Um, He would have had to need to suffer often since the foundation of the world why would that have necessarily needed to take place under the hypothetical he's offering? Right, so it happens at a specific point in time, but once it's instituted, it's there, which is not the case in the old sacrificial system. It was bound by time because you had sins that occurred for a while, and then you had festivals, Sabbaths, sacrifices that were offered, and then once that happened, the sin was gone, But being humans, sin came back, and so you're constantly having to fight off sin with these various sacrifices. He's saying that Jesus didn't need to do that because once he offers his one-time sacrifice, it goes both ways. And so there's also an implication here where he talks about it being done from the foundation of the world. What he's saying is, not only does Jesus' one sacrifice roll forward, but it also rolls backward. And so all the Jews that were under the law of Moses, their their sin had to be atoned for with Jesus' blood too. The blood of bulls and goats never took away their sin. They were placeholders. They were copies. They were important. They were symbolic. But Jesus' blood is what actually gets rid of the sin in both directions of history. And one thing that's kind of telling and, and is kind of a hint there is where he talks about the consummation of the ages So what's being discussed there is kind of going back to how he opened his book. If you remember in in verse 2 of chapter 1, he talks about this being the last days. In these last days, Jesus has come. And so this is what he's talking about here. The consummation, consummation of ages, what is being discussed, what he's trying to introduce them to this idea is that Jesus' sacrifice is not just, okay, now the better system has come and now you're under the, the new system. That is true, but the point is that is the centerpiece of all of human history. There is the world before Jesus and the world is after Jesus, and that's really the only two distinctions that matter. And I do find it fascinating that even though I don't think that this would have been any kind of proof against it, isn't it interesting that we count time by Jesus' life? We're living in the year 2022, 2022 years since what? The birth of Jesus. Now, I know that it's not exact, and there's some debate as to whether or not it happened, you know, about four or five years beyond the year zero, give or take, you know, however you're trying to calculate it. But the point is, all of human history hinges upon the sacrifice of Christ. And that's the argument that the Hebrew author is making here is that we have entered into a new age and even the old age is contingent upon the new. Everything that you're you're trying to go back to Judaism, you're trying to go back to these old systems and these old sacrifices and everything. He's saying there's nowhere left to go back to. You need Jesus's blood to be redeemed under that system as well. And so he's making the point that there is, there is no means of escape. Uh, in that sense. The only way to find redemption from sin is through Christ, even if you were talking about being back under the old law of Moses. So, verse 27 and 28. Just as it is destined for people to die, and after this comes judgment, so Christ, after, or so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. One of the things that I think is important about this particular verse is it gives us a connection to a shared human experience. 
Because in the same way that humans only died once, Jesus only died once. And so it's in contrast to what he was suggesting a couple of verses ago. He's saying this is one of the reasons that we don't have Jesus like coming down and dying for every individual sin. The reason that that doesn't take place is in part because it would have been untrue to the human experience. For Jesus to really live as a human being and to experience life as a human and temptations and that kind of thing, which by the way has already been discussed earlier in the book as being essential to him being the perfect sacrifice, then that meant he also had to die only one time. And so to have that connection with humanity, he needed to die just the one time, just like we only die the one time. And so when he says that in verse 28, he has been offered once to bear the sins of many and he will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, what does he mean that when Jesus comes back, it will be without reference to sin? Right, so there's a shift in the purpose of Jesus' second coming. The first time, you can see it in the Gospel of Matthew, for example, uh, 121, I think is the verse there, that Jesus comes to save the people from their sins. That's not the reason he's coming the second time. The second time he's coming, that's for judgment. Because he already came to, to save mankind once and he offered that to everybody. The second time is not when that happens. The salvation has already taken place. And the final time it will be judgment. And so there's a shift in purpose for his second coming. He already died once in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was counted with the wrongdoers. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the wrongdoers." So it's pretty easy for us to see the parallels between what was just being talked about and, and what's happening here. I mean, that's very clearly a Christ prophecy. And where he talks about this idea of this being the consummation of all the ages, this being the centerpiece of all of human history, that's what's being discussed here in Isaiah, is that all of these things are going to happen. He's going to be crushed. Um, it's going to be a way for him to bring salvation and bear the sins of many and then that's going to be the summation of all of human history right there. And so you can see the parallels and how this would have been a very strong proof of the truth of the Gospels by being able to invoke that term and then look back and see, wow, I mean, that just fits perfectly with the story of Jesus. And so for a Jewish person that was interested in that, even with that, that little phrase about bearing the sins of many, they would have immediately known, hey, I recognize this, this is coming directly from Isaiah. And so that's a very powerful proof in the Hebrew writer's argument there. So uh, he goes on in verse 10. Uh, for the law, or I said verse 10, chapter 10. Uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the form of the things itself, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually every year make those who approach perfect. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have, a, have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So here in this passage, we have, this is essentially why Jesus' sacrifice worked. This is the explanation, and it'll be continuing for the next several verses, but he's been building up this argument and sort of introducing these concepts, and this is the conclusion of that argument that he's making. He's saying, this is why the sacrifice of Jesus is superior to every other one, because if the sacrifice is perfect, why do you have to repeat it? If you do something right, you don't have to do it but one time. That's something that, you know, if you're a man, I'm sure your dad said that to you several times as a kid, if, if it's anything like mine. Uh, if I ever did a job and my dad had to do that job again, that was not a good day for me. And this is the same kind of concept, right? He's saying if the sacrifices under the Mosaic system was so good and it was so great at taking away sin and it did its job, well, why'd they have to keep doing it? 
over and over and over and over again, saying Jesus didn't have to do that because he did it once and he did it right. And he used the perfect sacrifice to alleviate all sin for all time if we are willing to take advantage of it. And so you keep trying to, to uphold this mosaic system as being so great and so much better than the Christian system, except the Christian system, you only had to do it that one time. And so that's the evidence that it is better. And then, and I love this because he's been building these ideas, and we've seen it for several chapters now. He's been building, and I was filling in for him, but yeah, it doesn't look like we have sound. All right, well, we tried. So uh, in this scene, I'll just describe it very quickly. Um, it's from Pirates of the Caribbean 2. And what's happening here is they have this little piece of paper that you just saw them pick up right there. And the piece of paper has a drawing of a key on it. And the reason that they need this key is because the main character played by Johnny Depp is trying to find this treasure. And the piece of paper he has has a picture of what the key looks like. And so they're saying, oh, so we're going after this treasure. And he's like, well, it wouldn't do us any good to go after the treasure considering we don't have the key. We have a picture of the key, but we don't have the key itself. And so in this analogy, is the paper useless? Does it mean nothing? Not really, because it does let him know what the key's going to look like. It lets him know what he's looking for. But if he shows up, and this is the point that he makes in the clip, if he somehow gets the treasure chest, but all he's got is this piece of paper, that's not going to open the treasure chest, so what good is it? And so the drawing of the key is the shadow of the thing. And just like it's the shadow of the key that will allow him to get what he wants inside the treasure chest, that's essentially what the law of Moses is. It's not worthless. It's not pointless. Because it gave us an idea of what Christianity would look like. It gave us an idea, a framework to understand the redemptive work of Jesus' sacrifice. But it's not the thing itself. And the law of Moses is not going to do us any good unless Jesus comes to earth and dies. And so when it's talking about the shadow of the thing in the same way that a shadow kind of gives you a vague idea of what the thing you're looking for is supposed to be like, it's not going to do you any good. I mean, if you have a picture of somebody, for example, that picture is good, but only because the picture reminds you of the actual person. If you don't know the person, the picture means nothing to you. And so in the same way, we have this shadow of the things to come. And that shadow is uh, what allows us to... Oop, I went two slides ahead, sorry. There we go. Um, that shadow of the thing to come, it gives us a frame of reference and something to work from, but ultimately it's only useful if we have the thing that the shadow is supposed to represent. And so uh, let's look real quickly at Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Therefore... When he comes into the world, he says, You have not desired sacrifice and offering, but you have prepared a body for me. You have not taken pleasure in the whole of burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Then I said, Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will. So this passage, and I'll read it very quickly because I know we're out of time, comes directly from Psalm 40. So we're going to read that psalm very quickly and then we'll close out. Psalm 40, uh, we'll go through, I think, verse 8. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He reached down to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the mud, and He set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and I will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who have become involved in falsehood. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done, and your thoughts toward us. There is no one to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. You have not desired sacrifice and meal offering. You have opened my ears. You have not required the burnt offering and the sin offering. Then I said, Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. I delight to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. So this psalm, very clearly, it's a psalm both of thanksgiving 
and a psalm for calling for forgiveness and rescue. And the point of all of that, and the reason that the Hebrew author is making this, this case, is he's saying, even under the Old Testament, you can see from inspiration David writing this, saying, the sacrifice is not actually what God wants. What God actually wants is obedience. Now, the sacrifice is something God commanded. Therefore, to be obedient means to do it. He's not saying you don't have to do the sacrifice. He's not saying that the sacrifice is meaningless. What he is saying is what is truly important in the sacrifice is not the sacrifice itself. It's the fact that you were obedient to God in doing what he has asked you to do. And under the new system, the same is true. If we do not have obedience, we do not get the benefit of the sacrifice of Jesus. All right, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.